Now, if you're going to be working in any type of Microsoft administration services these days, there are some fundamental principles that are very important that you understand. So what I want to do is I want to get into some of the foundations of understanding things like Microsoft domains, understanding some of the networking technologies, RAS and VPNs and virtualization, and also we're going to talk about the cloud services and how all that fits into this. But it's important to kind of start from the beginning so you can understand where things have been, understand where things are going, and you have to consider the fact that you know we're, the world is transitioning now more into a cloud-oriented uh, environment, but in the past everything was managed on-prem or on-premise, and we got to talk about this transition and how things were and how things are now and where Microsoft is going. So to start with, you know, we go back go back in time to the 1950s, 1960s. They had mainframes, these gigantic computers that would take up like entire rooms. Uh, they used vacuum tubes. And then as we moved into the 1970s, something miraculous happened. They created what was known as an IC, an integrated circuit, which allowed uh, basically binary math to be processed through little chips and this is where personal computing became popular so in the 1980s personal computers started coming out I'm gonna draw this little symbol here to represent a computer and uh, I tell you what I'm gonna create another little uh, symbol here to kinda represent a bunch of computers so in the 1980s companies started buying PCs and personal computers and they started showing up in people's offices and eventually you know they were networking them together and all of that and so this is where things really get started now of course in in those days one of the problems was we we lived in what was called a peer-to-peer -peer network so what would happen is these computers were you could network these computers together with various technologies but um, there was no centralization, meaning each computer was equal. There was no computer that controls all the other computers. A network admin would have to, uh, if they wanted to make changes, they'd have to sit down at each and every computer to make those changes or get users to help them, which was always a nightmare. Um, and so that didn't, you know, it worked, but it didn't work very efficiently. All right. Now, as we moved into the 1990s, there was a, a company. That kept that was gaining ground called Novell, Novell, and they had a product called Netware, which was the idea of that was to use a server that would help manage uh, machines and also allow people to share files easier. Whereas in a peer-to-peer -peer network back originally, these machines would have to share files with each other, and people would have to know each other's passwords. It just didn't work very well. Well, eventually, with the creation of the file server concept, you had a more powerful machine that you could share files on and all that, and Eventually, Novell even came out with the idea of a server that could manage other machines. Now, this is kind of where Microsoft comes in. Microsoft created their product called NT, and they created this uh, concept of a domain controller, which is a special type of server that can manage these other servers. Now, fast forward, they came out with what was known as a domain, but fast forward to the year 2000, Microsoft releases their newest domain technology, and they call it... Uh, Active Directory. An Active Directory domains were represented by a triangle. All right, and a domain controller was a, a server essentially that had a database on it, and that database was the Active Directory database. So let's just kind of fix that here. This little cylinder looking thing I'm going to make here is going to represent my Active Directory database. So uh, AD. All right. Um, and this was, is what we still call to this day, we call it ADDS, Active Directory Domain Services. And usually if you hear that term, uh, Active Directory Domain Services, it means it's an on-premise domain. So anyway, um, you would always want to have more than one domain controller. You, the reason you want to have more than one domain controller is because the same reason you have more than one of any type of, of server, really. One reason being... Um, to break up the disbursement of load, these machines will authenticate with these domain controllers. And the more machines you got, uh, you know, you don't want all of that just going to one domain controller, right? The other consideration is redundancy. If you only have one and that server goes down, well, you're in trouble, right? So we want to have multiple. The other thing about domain controllers that are interesting is that they replicate. So, uh, for example, let me make a, I'm going to make a little smiley face guy here, and this little smiley face guy is going to represent uh, my uh, user. 
So we create a user account on a domain controller. Now the interesting thing about user accounts, or the interesting thing really about domain controllers is that they replicate. So everything you do on one uh, will replicate over to the other. So if I create a user account on that first one, well, replication is gonna occur between uh, both of them. And so this little arrow thing I'm gonna make here is gonna represent replication. So domain controllers replicate. That means that this user could log on to any one of these thousands machine and it's gonna you know, authenticate with the uh, domain controller, all right? The authentication protocol that uh, is used is the protocol known as Kerberos, all right? Kerberos is the authentication uh, protocol. What is a protocol? It's like a language, basically, okay? Uh, now, there was an older protocol that, that, uh, that it also supported called NTLM. That was for legacy for older prior to the year 2000 machines. Now, the um, that protocol allowed us to have encrypted passwords and all that and authenticate securely and all that fun stuff. The other thing is, is Active Directory uses a language um, known as the Directory Service Language, and that language was called LDAP, Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. Now, all that is, again, this is all decades old at this point. Um, at the time when it came out, it was cutting edge, but it's, it is a bit dated nowadays. Uh, but it still works, and it's still pretty secure, though there are some considerations on security that I'm not going to explain right now. Now, the other thing that's important about Active Directory is that all machines have to have a name. And the name must be, of course, associated with an IP address and, and all of that. And so there is a service that we use that we use it on the Internet all the time called DNS, Domain Name Service. Our, our uh, domain must have a name. Usually when you name your domain, you would name it after your company, and a lot of people even name their domains based on their web presence. So, for example, my domain might be called examlabpractice.com. That's my company, my web presence. And um, I'm going to need to have a, a server in my domain that can associate the names and IP addresses together. So that server is called a DNS server. DNS, Domain Name System Server. And that server will also have to have a little database on it. And that database will be our DNS database. Okay. So we'll just draw another little cylinder. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight this, border it with red, and then I'm going to color code the database red, which means that this database, the DNS database, is associated with that name. Now what happens is our machines, clients, domain chores, we also might even have, let's, let's draw a file server over here. Pretty common that we have file servers in our environment. Okay, um, All of these machines would register with our... DNS, all right? And this allows for the centralization of name resolution, meaning they register their IP addresses into this database, and then now, anytime a machine needs to find another machine, it can query DNS. So for example, these machines all have to authenticate by your domain controllers. They can query DNS and say, hey, DNS, do you know what the uh, address is of one of my domain controllers so I can authenticate? And DNS can reply back and say, yeah, here is the information. At that point, the client can go and authenticate. So it works very efficiently. Now, all of this together, this, this idea of domain controllers, this triangle you see here, this provides centralization. So we, we moved away from peer-to-peer -peer networking back in the day where you know, every machine was kind of its own boss and there was no centralized way of managing things to now we are working in a centralized environment. These domain controllers help us centralize. This DNS service help, helps us centralize. So we now have some central control over things. One of the great things about our uh, domain controllers too is we have these wonderful things called GPOs, Group Policy Objects. A group policy object is this object that you can create that has all these settings, parameters, uh, you know, any type of attribute you want to configure or change on machines, you can do it through a GPO. So, for example, if your boss walks up to you and says, hey, I want you to um, force the firewalls to be turned on all these machines. I want to make sure that the antivirus is always up to date. 
Uh, I want you to disable some of the, the wallpaper feature. I don't want people you uh, putting crazy wallpapers on their machine. Um, so, I mean, you could, the sky's the limit. There are literally thousands of things you can do inside of a GPO, but what happens is that GPO can instruct these machines to turn things on and turn things off. GPOs also replicate, so when you create a GPO on a domain controller, it replicates over to the other domain controller. So it doesn't matter which machines you know, authenticate with which domain controller. All right, so these GPOs can be deployed out to these machines, and this is how you turn things on, turn things off. You could even deploy software with that if you wanted to. So it was, a, it was very, very powerful, um, a very, very powerful system for managing everything. All right, uh, of course, let's let's throw the internet into the mix here. Let's say that this little cloud is going to represent the, uh, you know, the internet, and um, let's talk about kind of a little bit about how that sort of fits into the picture. Let me just clean it up here with the mighty stroke of my paintbrush. I will clean up the internet. <laughs> All right. Um, all right, so then we have the internet, right? So maybe we've got an internet connection that's coming in here. All right, and of course you don't want to just leave your internal network exposed, so your company would generally have a firewall, right? Um, and we would, we'll just put that firewall right here. And so now we have... Um, you know, a secure way for traffic to flow out to the internet, and uh, the only things that can come in would be things that we send out, and we could allow things through that firewall if we want to. Now, this is a traditional domain. This is the way we've done things for 20 years, all right? Um, and in this next little section, I want to talk about uh, expansion on all of this and where where things have gone with things like RAS and all that and VPN and virtualization. So um, that'll wrap this little section up and we'll move on to the next. I now want to talk about some concepts that are also sort of the foundation of how we've done things over the years. It's important to understand how we've done things over the years so we can understand how uh, things are now. So looking back, we have an Active Directory Domain, ADDS as it's called, Active Directory Domain Services, which uses the LDAP Lightweight Director Access Protocol, which uses Kerberos for authentication or for this older, for the legacy back in the 90s devices that used NTLM, a new technology land manager, which is, isn't all very new these days. But uh, even Kerberos is pretty old con uh, considering, you know, we've been using it for, for decades and I think actually the protocol even came out back in the 1980s. So, you know, so we got some data technologies, but the technologies have been updated, a lot of them over the years, to be secure. So you can still feel comfortable using those. But let's talk about some different scenarios now. Um, the first thing I want to look at is the scenario of what happens when we have a user who is not at the office. So this person is working from home. Working from home is a lot more popular nowadays than it has been in the past, so it's very common. And this person needs the ability, perhaps, to you know be able to connect in and access uh, services that are inside. Okay, um, and we've got a file server, but you know ultimately, we we you probably are aware that you know in the past, um, it was always this mindset of do it yourself, host your own server. So you know your companies might have they might have a file server. But then they might also have a, um, you know, they might be, they might have a SQL database server that that users need to access. Let's let's create that SQL. All right. Um, maybe uh, Microsoft Exchange. That was email, right? Microsoft Exchange was, uh, you know, used for email, and then maybe even like SharePoint was very popular by Microsoft on-premise. So here you've got these, you know, these four servers providing a service to our devices. And um, you've got users working from home and everything else needing to get access to those. Let me just kind of move those a little bit over here. Make a little bit of room here. And I'm gonna shrink those down just a little bit as well. All right, 
So th this user who is working from home needs to access these services, but the person is not, uh, you know, not around. Well, let me tell you what you shouldn't do. You shouldn't just open up all the ports on the firewall and allow this person in to get access to these um, devices unsecurely. In fact, in the 90s, a lot of companies did that. The very first company I ever worked for uh, back in the 90s, they didn't really have a firewall, so you literally could share out your, you had a public address and uh, you could connect to it from home. It was really scary when I think about it. Even in the 90s, that was scary, but nowadays it's incredibly scary. Why is it scary? Because you got these people out there that want to do things that um, they shouldn't do and, and you know, get access to companies' data and, and try to do damage and ransom and all of that, ransomware and all that. And, and who are these people? Well, we, we generally call them hackers, right? So let me draw a little hacker. This, uh, this little, this little uh, box here is going to represent my hacker. All right, and let's make him let's make this hacker look like he's up to no good all right i'm just gonna i'm gonna give him like a let's give him like a devil horns some devil horns here and maybe like uh you know he's he's in a bad mood i'm gonna give him a frowny face and give him some fangs and maybe the fangs are dripping blood every okay no i'm just kidding <laughs> sorry sometimes i get carried away all right but uh anyway that's gonna be my hacker all right goofy looking little hacker person all right and um, so we don't want this hacker like spying on my user. We don't want this hacker getting access to resources inside. So how do we get around that? Well, usually the way we would do that is you would use a VPN, a virtual private network. So the way you would do that is you could purchase what was called a VPN concentrator. And basically it's a device that um, allows secure connections in. But in the Microsoft world, we actually had a type of server we could set up uh, called a RAS server or also known as an RAS server because it stood for routing and remote access services. But um, anyway, remote access services is the idea here. And with that, we have support for VPN. Now, what does that do? This allows this thing called a VPN tunnel to be created, which means that you have this encrypted communications that goes through to that RAS server. And then from there, that RAS server allows you to access other resources securely. This hacker will not be able to see the, um, the traffic that's flowing through because it's all encrypted. The only thing the hacker would be able to see is that it was going up to this firewall and that would be it. Wouldn't be able to see what the traffic said. So this is how we would, we would definitely help secure things. Now, the other thing that I want to talk to you about here is what happens when a company needs to have a service that is exposed to the internet. For example, let's say that your company is going to host their own web server, okay? So you set up a web server. All right, maybe this is gonna be www.examlabpractice.com or whatever, and people from the internet need to be able to get to it anonymously. Um, well, how are you gonna do that? Where are you gonna put that web server? Are you gonna put it internally? inside the domain like you see here. And the reason that's scary is because you would have to open up port 443, port 80, which is the HTTP, HTTP ports to allow traffic to get in, which means not only could you know somebody out there on the internet anonymously get into this web server, but technically so could a hacker. And if a hacker was ever to gain access over this website by hacking it, then something called pivoting could occur where a hacker could actually gain access to these other services that are on your network. And so that's where things are really scary. So you definitely won't want to host it internally most of the time, although there was a way to do something called a reverse proxy. I won't get into that right now. But we would probably want to put this outside, right? So we'd want to put it out here. Um, but there's something else that's a problem on that. If you put it outside that firewall, you don't have to worry about, you know, people getting, you know, allowing traffic to come in. But the only that the scary thing about that is the fact that this poor web server is now completely exposed to the internet, so with no protection. So the way around that usually is people would get another firewall. So you'd have two firewalls. This first firewall was would be called the uh, internal connected firewall, and then you, this firewall here would be called the external connected firewall. Now this little network between that, we would call that a DMZ, demilitarized zone, 
or now the more popular term is perimeter network. Okay, so DMZ perimeter network are basically the same thing. All right, um, and so now what you would do is you'd only open you would only open the ports like port 80, 443, 53 for DNS if you put DNS in there. Uh, whatever ports there that you need and now traffic would be able to get to this web server okay um, and so uh, even if a hacker you know somehow hacks this web server you're not going to allow traffic to pass through this firewall and get to these resources the only traffic that you might allow would be VPN okay um, and, and there's a bunch of authentication and all that that has to happen to make that work all right, so that's the idea of remote access and VPNs in a nutshell for you, as well as the concept of DMZ and uh, the perimeter network idea. Uh, now, the, the final thing I want to look at with you um, in this video is the idea of virtualization. So I talked about how in the past, uh, it was always the, the mindset was we got to host everything ourselves. We got to have our own little data center. We got to have our, you know, we got to have our own servers, file server, SQL exchange, SharePoint, all that. And it's all got to be hosted by us. And that's the way things have always been done. All right. Um, now, uh, then what you'll find is, is as time went on, uh, a company called VMware came out with a uh, a way of expanding on virtualization. Just so you know, virtualization is not a new term. Virtualization has been around for a very long time. In fact, the term hypervisor is the essentially the software that lets us emulate hardware. And if you can emulate hardware, you can also store software on that emulated hardware. That's the idea of virtualization. Um, that term hypervisor has been around since the 1970s. The idea of even mainframes dividing up processing time and doing shared computing was a form of virtualization. So this is not a new concept, but VMware, they expanded on this idea and the and the, the thing that they did that really pushed the envelope on all this was that, hey, you don't necessarily need four different servers. And here's the other thing, here's the other crazy thing. If you wanted redundancy for those four servers, you'd really need eight servers, right? You could do clustering those together. So you'd have eight servers to provide redundancy for those. But with, with uh, virtualization, I can set up a hypervisor server, one server, and, and, and virtualize those other servers. Now, in the Microsoft world, we call that Hyper-V. That is the, the software that does this, Hyper-V, hyper, Hypervisor. Uh, Microsoft's not the one that came up with that. VMware's not the first to ever come up with that. VMware was the biggest contributor to this concept, though, so I do have to give them credit where credit is due. All right, now the other beautiful thing, though, about this is you get a really, really powerful machine. You virtualize your um, machines on those. You get these things called um, checkpoints in Microsoft. They used to be called snapshots, and a lot of other companies still call them snapshots, where you can make changes without the worry of breaking anything because you can revert back to before the change was made. The other thing that's wonderful about um, using virtualization is if I want to com uh, have complete redundancy, I don't have to have eight servers. I could literally you know, purchase another server and have a copy of the virtual machines on that other server. Now I've only got two servers as opposed to having to have uh, a total of eight servers. Okay, so this is a very powerful feature capability that kind of uh, started everything. Another thing that we got, and, and this is kind of where you start thinking about cloud computing, is with virtualization comes the, the term elasticity, which basically means that each of these machines can be given a certain amount of RAM processing power. But here's what's interesting about that. If one of the servers isn't using all of the available RAM that it's been given, it can share it with other servers. So for example, this file server has been given more RAM than it needs and then SQL needs that RAM, the file server can give up some of that RAM over to SQL. And when SQL's done using that extra memory, it can release it back to everybody. It's basically a pool type scenario where it gets released into a pool of RAM and pool of CPU, and they can grow and shrink as they need. And that's the, the, the small way of sort of uh, on-premise way of looking at elasticity. Of course, when you get into cloud computing, you'll learn that that can expand across multiple machines across the you know, the, the board in these big data centers, but not to get into that just yet here. But 
that's the idea. Hopefully that now helps you with understanding that concept of what virtualization is. And with that is really where, you know, cloud computing started to come into play, which I'm not explaining in this video. But hopefully now you have a much better understanding of the concept of, of the RAS VPN as well, the DMZ uh, concepts and virtualization. And now we'll in this next section, we'll start getting into the concept of cloud services. So with the creation of virtualization, it got companies thinking. Companies like Amazon and Google and Intel and IBM and eventually even Microsoft that, hey, we've got these massive data centers. Uh, why not allow people to pay us to host their virtual machines on our data center. So in other words, we can get people to pay us money to host their virtual machines and they don't have to deal with all the headaches of dealing with everything on premise. So this is really the idea of where cloud services came from. And so I'm gonna draw this kind of big cloud here this is going to represent cloud computing, if you will. We'll have a connection coming down here, okay? And I will just kind of clean that up a little bit, make it somewhat look nice. So this being, you know, the big I, big thing is this is not an, a new concept of, if you think about humans as a whole, we have offered services for years. I know how to change the oil in my car, but I don't necessarily enjoy doing it. So I can pay a, uh, a mechanic shop um, the, the fee and they will do it for me as a service, right? Well, this is the idea of cloud services. So there's some acronyms I wanna introduce you to, the first one being the term IAAS, and that is infrastructure as a service. So infrastructure as a service means the cloud provider is offering their infrastructure for a fee as a service, okay? So the idea being something like this, instead of me having to host my virtual machines and all that in my on-premise environment, I can pay this cloud company to host virtual machines for me. They can also host a virtual network for you. They can host, uh, they can have storage that's uh, offered to you. They can have firewalls, virtual firewalls that are associated on those virtual networks and virtual load balancers, okay? They can have apps out there that are available. They can have virtual databases that are hosted in the cloud. So essentially just about anything you could imagine that you can host on premise can be hosted out there in the, the cloud service. Uh, now, Amazon, Google, IBM, Intel, Microsoft, these various companies offer this Microsoft's cloud service uh, that does this, their, their IAAS service is called Azure. Now, let me just kind of clarify, you may pronounce that name, that word a little different than I do, Azure or Azure or Azure. Actually, it, years ago when I was first learning Azure, I actually went to uh, the internet and started watching videos of the developers that created Azure and the first few developers that I watched, that's how they pronounced it. They pronounced it Azure. So that's how I just assumed that it needed to be pronounced. Of course, I learned later down the road that not all the developers even agree on how to pronounce that word. Some of them pronounced it Azure, Azure, uh, Azure. I've even heard somebody pronounce it Azure. So this is one of those tomato, tomato, pronounce that word any way you want to pronounce it. That's how I say it, which is Azure, okay? So Azure is Microsoft's official um, Inner infrastructure as a service. And the way that it all works is you pay a fee for what you use every month. Basically, how much CPU, memory, storage, network, all of that that you use, that's what you're going to pay for. Okay. Now, there are some other terms, uh, other uh, acronyms that I want to introduce you to. There is an acronym called PAAS, which stands for Platform as a Service, and an acronym called SAAS, which is software as a service. Now, the uh, the uh, the idea there being that there are, well, we'll start with, uh, with software as a service first. Software as a service, the idea is that there is a fully functional app or application that is 100% ready for you to start using or your users to start using. All you got to do is just jump right in and start using it. Okay, so there are some 
uh, Azure services that are software as a service. There's also what are called platforms as a service. Now, platform as a service is kind of a, uh, there's a little bit more work involved from an admin standpoint. So a platform as a service means there is a some type of software platform that is available for you to start using and it's 100% ready for you to use, but you have to go and administer it and use it before it's going to really do anything. Uh, a good example of this is Microsoft's directory services in the cloud is called Intra-ID. Intra-ID. All right. Which I want to make, it's very important that you realize that this was formally called Azure AD. And there's still a lot of documentation out there that refers to this as Azure AD. So it's very important that, uh, that you are aware of that. Now, you are taking my course right now, and you should realize that um, I have hundreds of hours of videos that still may, that I've, I've got to update that involve that term Azure AD. There are literally hundreds of hours that I have recorded using the term Azure AD, and I'm in the process of updating videos, but be aware that I don't have them all upgraded. So you may hear me refer in the course to stuff as Azure AD. I actually have a video on this for you to watch after these foundation videos. It's a video that says, do not skip. So please do not skip that video. Make sure you watch that video because it's gonna talk about this name change. So anyway, the name is now Intra-ID. It's just a name change. They changed it to Azure AD. The services are pretty much all the same. It's just a name change. Okay, so Intra-ID is a platform as a service. Now, it is Microsoft's directory services. This is where your user accounts and passwords and groups and permissions, role permissions and all that are all managed through Intra-ID, formerly Azure AD, okay? Um, whereas on-premise in a domain, we called it ADDS, Active Directory Domain Services, all right? I think that's part of the reason Microsoft changed the name to kind of distinguish the difference between the on-premise uh, Active Directory and the former Active Directory, Azure AD, to Intra-ID. Anyway, um, this platform as a service is ready for you to use, but there's only like one user, and that's the admin, and then you're responsible for going in there as an admin and adding users and controlling things. That's why it's a platform as a service. It's not 100% uh, set up. You have to administer it. Now, Microsoft's main... Uh, platform as a service uh, functions and software as a service, they have something called Microsoft 365. So there's really two parts to the Microsoft Cloud Service. There's Azure, uh, which is mostly focused on the IaaS side of things. And don't get me wrong, in Azure there are also some platform as a services and software as a services, but it's mostly geared towards IaaS. Whereas Microsoft 365 is mostly geared towards platform as a service. Now, these two are very related. Microsoft 365 sits on top of Azure. You can't have Microsoft 365 without Azure. And if you create an Azure account, then it'll allow you to automatically create a Microsoft 365 account. So these are all related. You're not just going to create an Azure account or not just going to create a Microsoft 365 account. They're pretty much linked together. Okay. Now, in the Microsoft 365 services, you have lots of platform as a services and software as a, as a service. For example, uh, we have the what are called the Microsoft 365 apps for enterprise, which that was formerly called Office 365, and that's the downloadable version of off the, the Microsoft 365 apps, formerly the Office 365 apps like Word, Excel, PowerPoint, all of that. And there is also something called Office for the web. Now that is fully a software as a service. The uh, the Microsoft 365 apps for enterprise, that is actually a mix. It's a platform as a service and a software as a service. Most people refer to it as a software as a service because they're downloadable apps. But as an admin, from an admin standpoint, we have to administer that. So the administration side of it is platform as a service. Uh, Office for the web is 100% software as a service. These are web-based versions of the Office apps that are ready for you, for your users to use. They get Once they get a license, they can use it. Okay. Then we have Exchange Online. Okay. So the administration side of that is a platform as a service, but the user side of that is a software as a service, right? And then we've got SharePoint Online, which is the same idea. It's a 
you know, admin side is a platform as a service, but the user side, which is what most everybody focuses on, is a uh, software as a service. We have Microsoft Teams, same thing for that, okay? Um, you know, for, for messaging and, and all of that fun stuff. We have uh, a product called Intune, which is an incredibly powerful product. Uh, mobile device management, mobile uh, application management. Intune is what is sort of taking the place of GPOs in the cloud. So on premise, we could control the settings and parameters and attributes, and we could deploy software and all that using GPOs on premise. Well, now when it comes to the cloud service, we can use Intune. We can actually control on premise machines from Intune. So it is very, very powerful, an incredibly powerful product. Then we've got we've got OneDrive for Business. OneDrive for Business is a cloud-based storage that users can have access to. So anyway, there there's actually so many products that are cloud-based products. There's no way I could put them all in here, but here's some of the main, you know, main things. Now, as far as the licensing and, and all of that, with Azure, you are paying for what you use, CPU, RAM, storage, and network. But for the Microsoft 365 services, you have what are called subscriptions, and you purchase a subscription with a certain amount of licenses. So if, for example, if I purchase a Microsoft 365 subscription, I can purchase a certain amount of licenses, and I can issue those out to my users, and I will pay a monthly fee for however many licenses that I've got with my subscription. Okay, and that's just a, a giving you a basic understanding of how that works exactly. Okay, so ultimately though, if I could kind of color code this, uh, we'll say that, you know, the, the Azure side of this, IaaS, and again, Azure does have some platform as a service stuff as well as software as a service, but it's mostly geared to be a I, uh, infrastructure as a service. And then the uh, Microsoft 365 is mostly platform as a service, software as a service. So if I was to kind of draw a, um, you know, kind of just draw around these, we would say that the these right here are all geared towards Microsoft 365. And then this, these are geared towards the infrastructure service, which is Azure. And both of these, Azure and Microsoft 365, they share intra-ID. They share intra-ID, okay? Yellow, or uh, red and blue make purple, right? <laughs> okay. So they actually, um, you create users in the Azure side or the Microsoft 365 side, you're going to see the same users because they are linked together. They share the same directory service. So it's important to understand that. Now, the other piece of this is what about situations where you want to link all this together? So it's not uncommon nowadays for companies, you know, to have this triangle, to have this uh, on-premise domain, and then also start utilizing Microsoft's cloud services. Um, and then, you know, in the for years and years, they've always pushed this thing called SSO. SSO is single sign-on, where you have a, a user has a user account, and that user account gives them access to everything they need. Well, we don't get SSO if you have to have a user account to access things in your domain and then a different user to access things in the cloud, right? Well, Microsoft has ways around that. They actually have uh, services that you can use for linking these together. And that service, let me just kind of move some of this around a little bit so I can make a little bit more room. We'll put the DNS server there. We'll move this little RAS server down over here. And the server is called Intra Microsoft Intra Connect. And it was formally formally Azure AD Connect. Okay. So then so again it's called Intra Connect now and it used to be called Azure AD Connect. And um, I'm definitely I, I like to refer to it with the old name as well, just because be advised you really kind of need to know the old name as well, because there's still a lot of documentation that will refer to this as the older name. The newer name is IntraConnect. The the older name is is uh, Azure AD Connect. But this was a server you could set up on premise, and what it would do is it'll synchronize your user accounts out to the cloud, so your on premise user accounts would get synchronized. So whatever users you have on-premise, and you don't have to synchronize them all, you could pick and choose which one you synchronize, but your user accounts are gonna sync out to intra-ID, 
And now what will happen is you have this thing called seamless SSO where when your users log on to the domain, it logs them on in both places. They log on to the on-premise domain as well as in the cloud, which is really, really cool. Now that is a heavier weight version. There is actually a, um, a lighter weight version that's a very, very lightweight application. You don't actually have to dedicate a server to it like they kind of want you to with Inter uh, Connect. There is actually another lighter weight tool called uh, IntraSync or IntraID Sync, which is a lighter weight. Now there's some pluses and minuses to go in either route, which I'm not gonna get into right now, but the uh, the traditional way to do this was to use uh, this here, IntraConnect, formerly Azure AD Connect. Now the other thing I'll tell you is this does not sync back. So it would sync users out, but it won't sync users that are created out in the cloud back to on-premise. You cannot currently do that. You can't synchronize users that are created in IntraID down here but any users can be synced out and it'll even make it where if they change their password like out in the cloud it'll it'll sync that as well so anyway that kind of gives you a, a rundown of that now i'll also tell you that microsoft is moving away from domains in fact if you um if if you've got an on-premise domain like like what you see here, then yeah, it's a great idea to, to utilize this. But if you're a new company, and this really pains me to say it because I have um, fed my family for over two decades by, by not only teaching about Active Directory on-premise, but also implementing Active Directory on-premise as a consultant. Um, and so it kind of pains me to say this, but as a consultant now, I'm not even recommending that newer companies implement a domain anymore. Um, a lot of companies are now moving to the cloud and there's ups and downs of that. But to be honest with you, in most cases, your co a company gets out cheaper by utilizing uh, cloud services, okay? Um, and so nowadays you can actually set up on-premise machines and manage them through Intune and things like that that are in the cloud. You can even have client machines hosted in the cloud, but I'm not gonna dive into that right now. Uh, ultimately though, if you are a company that's been around for a while, then the traditional approach that you see here where you've got a, a domain um, and then you're starting to move into the cloud, you can set up IntraConnect, formerly Azure AD Connect, uh, or IntraID Sync, and which is the lighter weight version, and you can have things synchronized out to the cloud. All right. All right. Well, hopefully these foundation videos have been instruct instructional to you. I hope you got a lot out of this and you're ready to move on. I now want to spend some time helping you understand the concepts of Microsoft Sentinel. So what is Microsoft Sentinel? Well, this is a bunch of services that are mixed together. The main two services that Microsoft Sentinel brings to the table, though, is SIM and SOAR. Also, SIM is sometimes pronounced SIEM, depending upon who you talk to. The, uh, the idea here is to provide uh, a, a product that's very scalable, it's cloud-based and it can communicate with the various services in Azure as well as Microsoft 365. All right, what in what is the gist of, of a SIM, SIEM, or SOAR? Well, uh, security information and event management is a, a technology. It's been around for quite a while. It's not a technology Microsoft created. This is their version of it, but the idea is that uh, it is a type of product that can go out and grab logging data and monitoring data and reporting data from various places and then put all of that into a central location where we can view it and categorize it, correlate it, aggregate all of this log data in one place and easily find what we're looking for. And then SOAR, Security Orchestration Automated Response, this technology, another technology Microsoft didn't create, uh, it's been around for a while though. When I say they didn't create it, Sentinel is their creation, but these are, um, these are basically vendor neutral technologies themselves. The idea of SOAR is to, uh, when you detect threats and, and have threats that you're working with or alerts you're working with, SOAR can automate the response with actions. So you're not dealing with uh, an admin having to manually deal with every problem as it arises. So. Sentinel is meant to provide intelligence security analytics and be a threat intelligence solution that centralizes everything. Everything So it detects everything, it look, helps you look for threats and um, proactively hunt for things and then, have, and then do, have a response to those threats. 
So purposes of Sentinel, just to kind of recap here, you have secure information event management, secure orchestration, automation response. Okay, it's an enterprise solution help with, to help with threat intelligence. It's all about trying to unify all the pieces of the Microsoft Cloud services together, not to mention even linked to on-premise and third-party uh, based uh, services and products. It acts as sort of like an enterprise-wide watchtower that's uh, going to take the burden off of admins and dealing with the different complex attacks that happen and then also understanding the various alerts and incidents. So there's a cycle of protection that this pr uh, provides, as you can see here, collect, detect, investigate, respond. So the first thing being aggregate your data and pull it all into a central place where we can look for threats and also have automation that does the same. Uncover hidden threats to try to reduce things like false alarms. That gets into you know the concept of false positives and all of that. And uh, have a way of analyzing the data that we've collected. In other words, we can grab advanced analytic data and um, look for new threats perhaps that Microsoft hasn't even uncovered. It can also employ AI, artificial intelligence, to uh, probe through hundreds of thousands to maybe even millions of entries that get discovered. I mean, you're thinking, you think about a human being trying to do that. It's, it's I won't say impossible, but it gets close. With, uh, with artificial intelligence, you have this AI that can go through there and look for different patterns and recognize different behaviors and then detect um, these advanced threats. And then, of course, on top of that, we can swiftly tackle these incidents and automate uh, using automated workflows and pre program actions. We can have tasks that are going to run. Another thing, of course, here is the beginning of all of this, if you think about it, is like collecting the information, collecting the data. So Sentinel supports data connectors, and these data connectors link out to the Microsoft platforms, such as Microsoft 365 Defender, Defender for Cloud, Office 365, Microsoft Defender for IoT, amongst many, many others. Uh, Azure-based services as well, like Microsoft Intra-ID, formerly known as Azure AD, the uh, various Azure activities, Azure Storage, Azure Key Vault, Kubernetes service, all of that stuff. Um, not only that, Sentinel provides connectors for various security assets and, app and appliances, applications that we have on premise, uh, not just in the Microsoft environment, but also some of the third party out there as well. We have integrations with um, a lot of the common formats like the Microsoft Event format, syslog, REST, a REST API, and pretty much in everything nowadays supports representational state transfer API. So uh, unless you're dealing with an old technology, um, even if you have a technology that wasn't built specifically for working with uh, um, SOAR or SIM, SIEM, then um, this is going to work with it regardless. So the other thing, of course, is correlating alerts into incidents by using analytic rules. So the um, great thing about this is it grabs all this information and it puts it in a, uh, a normalized format. So even though you might be pulling various logs from different places and these different logs are in different formats, it puts the log into a central normalized format that's easy to understand, easy to read. And, uh, and this is going to help, and it's going to leverage machine learning um, to help identify the various behaviors that are happening, and uh, we can have action steps, of course, that take place. Speaking of which, that gets into automate and orchestrate, so um, the SOAR side of this. So the, the goal being that we can sort of streamline these automations. We have uh, playbooks, what they call management, you, uh, automated management using what are called playbooks that can be compatible with Azure as well as other third-party tools. Um, it supports logic apps for creating playbooks and uh, provides a you know series of different connectors to the various services that are out there. For example, you can see some of those listed there. ServiceNow, Jira, Zendesk, uh, HTTP Request, Microsoft Teams, Slack, IntraID, uh, Microsoft Defender for Endpoint, Microsoft Defender for Cloud Apps. And that is just a short list. There's more than that, but that just kind of gives you a a glimpse of it. So, you know, ultimately the goal is we're we're collecting information, we're detecting what's going on, and then we're trying to provide some way of automating uh, some type of mitigation or action that we want it to perform with the help of 
um, using the Azure Logic uh, Apps um, playbooks. And finally, we can investigate the scope and root cause of the security threats. So even when we have had Sentinel act on something, we can further investigate things. Microsoft Sentinel allows advanced investigation capabilities that's going to let us um, find various security issues that are going on. Okay, We have a dynamic graph. You can see an example of that on the screen here that you can probe a little bit further into the details of what's going on and try to figure out the underlying cause of the threat itself. All right. So um, ultimately, I think you're going to find Sentinel is very powerful. It's really starting to gain some ground. It's taken a couple of years for it to really get a nice foothold in the industry. But with Microsoft starting to more and more dominate the industry as far as cloud services goes, it's, uh, it's becoming a, a big deal out there as far as uh, this type of thing goes, dealing with collection of logs, discovering what's out there, providing a machine learning system for um, you know, automating the uh, and dealing with the various threats. It's, uh, it's definitely a contender out there. It's not the only product out there that does this type of thing, but what's great about it is it's integrated with our services already, which of course is gonna give Microsoft a uh, an advantage, but it also provides an advantage for us because it makes life easy for connecting everything and, uh, and using it. So hopefully that now gives you a better understanding of Microsoft Sentinel. Now if you're going to implement uh, Microsoft Sentinel, you're going to have to have a Sentinel workspace. Now I want to talk about planning that out and then we're going to go ahead and configure that. Uh, so to start with, the first thing to be aware of is the prerequisites for this. If we go out to Google or Bing and just do a quick search on Microsoft Sentinel prerequisites, you'll find this little article right here. Okay, so let's pull that up. And the prerequisites they tell you are you got to have a Microsoft Intra ID license, um, formerly Azure AD license. Um, and they tell you an individual account with a valid payment method. Okay, so we have all that. We have a subscription, all of that fun stuff. Um, the main thing I want to kind of hone in on is we need a log analytics workspace. They tell you this is going to be required to house all of the data that Microsoft Sentinel will be ingesting and uh, using for its detections, uh, analytics, and other features. So that's going to be a key thing to remember. And then, of course, it talks about permissions and all that stuff, but I'm not going to dive into that in this video. Okay. The other thing is, let's just jump over and look at the pricing. You can look down here and you, you, uh, you can actually just do a quick Google or Bing search on Microsoft Sentinel pricing. You'll come across this little article here and uh, this page here, and you can put in your region and they tell you what the pricing is. So um, pay as you go, in my case for East US, which is what I'm using at the creation of this video, it's $4.3 per gigabyte ingested. All right, and you can kind of see from there, 100 gigabytes per day, $296 per day, so on and so forth. All right, um, so this is sort of the, the pricing that you're looking at there. Uh, so that's something to consider if you're planning this out. You want to, you definitely want to read through this article when it comes to pricing before you implement this in your company, especially in a larger organization. Okay. All right. So let's jump over to portal.azure.com. Click the menu button, go to all services, and we'll click um, uh, the search bar here or filter services uh, area here, and we'll type log analytics and you'll see log analytics workspace and we're going to click to create a log analytics workspace all right now we got to create a resource group i'm just going to call this sentinel rg which is short for sentinel resource group very creative name i know uh, i'm going to click ok and then uh it says give it a name i'm going to call it sentinel um let's say log workspace all right, and then region will be East US. We're going to go ahead and click Review and Create. Wait for the validation to complete, and then I'm going to click to Create. All right, so I'm just going to wait on that deployment to finish, and I'll just pause the recording while that's happening. 
Now that our log analytics workspace has been created, we're ready to create our Sentinel workspace. So we're going to go to the menu button here and go to all services and we're going to search for Sentinel. Okay, you'll see Microsoft Sentinel is an option here. Okay, and we're going to click to create. All right, and you can see that it has detected that we have our uh, Sentinel log workspace there. So we can go ahead and we can add that. So add Microsoft Sentinel to a workspace. And we're going to go ahead and do that. And this is uh, essentially creating a Sentinel workspace with that log analytics workspace. And we've now officially got Sentinel added. And you'll see they've got the free trial active on the workspace. They basically give you 30 days uh, free trial to kind of play around with it. They tell you during the trial, you get up to 10 gigabytes a day for free for uh, Sentinel and Log Analytics. And then the data beyond the 10 gigs included quantity, quantity will be built. And they tell you you can learn more here. So anyway, we've now officially got that set up and we are... Uh, we're ready to roll to play around with Sentinel. I now like to go over the different uh, roles and permissions that we have in regards to working with Microsoft Sentinel. So uh, the first thing we should do is take a look. If we go out to Google or Bing, do a quick Google or Bing search on Microsoft Sentinel roles. You're going to come across this article right here. They, they basically lay it all out for you right here. So there are um, roles that are specific to Microsoft Sentinel. Okay, you have the Microsoft Sentinel Reader, which can uh, view data, incidents, workbooks, and other Microsoft Sentinel, Sentinel resources. But as you can imagine, with a Sentinel Reader, this person cannot change anything. Okay, they're just a reader. So this is great for somebody that needs to be able to see information but not change anything. You've got a responder. They can, um, in, uh, in addition to the above, they can you know, read, they can do the same thing as the reader, but they can also manage incidents, sign and dismiss incidents. You've got contributor, which uh, can do the above, but they can install and update solutions from the content hub, create and edit workbooks, analytic, uh, analytics rules, and other Microsoft Sentinel resources. You've got the Sentinel playbook operator, which, uh, can list, view, and manually run playbooks and then the Microsoft Sentinel uh, automation contributor which allows Microsoft Sentinel to add playbooks to automation rules and uh, tells you it, it's, it isn't meant for user accounts. So this is more of a service principle type scenario. Um, then they tell you some of the other roles and permissions you can assign if you create for like custom a custom role for a particular uh, requirement that you have, install and manage out-of-box content, uh, automate response to threats with playbooks, give Microsoft Sentinel permissions to run playbooks, connect data sources to Microsoft Sentinel, allow guest users to assign incidents, create and delete workbooks. All right. They also tell you that uh, Azure and Log Analytics roles you might uh, might see assigned. Also, you have the roles: the owner, contributor, reader. That's um, you know, when you create the resource group and all that, you're going to be considered the owner. Log analytics as well, you will be, is the creator of it, you will be the owner of it as well. So they tell you, for example, a user assigned to the Sentinel reader role, but not the contributor role, can still edit items in Sentinel if they, if the user is assigned the Azure level contributor role. Therefore, if you want to grant permissions to user, to the user only in Microsoft Sentinel, carefully remove this user's prior permissions making sure you don't break any needed access to another resource. They even give a little table right here you can kind of look through. Kind of breaks it all down for you what you can and can't do. All right. Of the uh, the various privileges that you're going to get. All right. And uh, so if we go back over here to portal.azure.com We'll uh, click the menu button and go to resource groups. Keep in mind, you may not see the same resource groups as me if you're doing this with me. The only one that I care about right now is the one called Sentinel RG. I'm going to go into that resource group, and then from there, I'm going to click on this Access Control I Am Blade. All right? And, of course, that's where our role management and all that fun stuff is going to be. Okay? 
and uh, I can go to role assignments here and you can see if any roles have been given out see what those are as you can see myself I've been given owner uh, privileges but uh, which means that owner privilege filters down to everything so I pretty much have rights to do everything but if I click add I can click add role assignment all right and if we scroll down and look at the various role assignments you'll see there's a lot of role assignments right but what we need to do is filter this list so we're just going to put in the word Microsoft there and it should filter it down and we should be able to scroll down and see Microsoft Sentinel so here are your various Sentinel roles right here okay so if you wanted to sign, let's say you wanted to assign the Microsoft Sentinel contributor, for example, there it is right there. Okay, we'll see it. If you wanted to view it, you could click view. Okay, um, guess got to wait on the permissions to load up. You can see what the rights are right here, what privileges that it gets, all the different uh, privileges, but you'll have that role click next and then if you wanted to assign that to a user you could specify the user you want to assign it to okay it's a little bit overkill I've pretty much already got everything I need as a since I'm owner but that's how I would assign it to myself if I wanted to alright and we've now assigned that role okay so that is how you can give out role permissions with Microsoft Sentinel. I want to talk now about how uh, Sentinel deals with its log types, log storage, and log retention. So uh, as far as log storage goes, uh, Sentinel uses a log analytics workspace to store its information. So let's take a look at that right now. We'll explore some of uh, what's going on there. So here we are on portal.azure.com. We're going to go ahead and uh, click the menu button, go to all services, and we'll just search for log analytics, and we'll see log analytics workspace right here. And then we'll click on our log analytics workspace that we've already created. Okay, once we get into that, um, we're going to go under settings. And this is our tables. This is where our, our logs, our log data can be stored. So the various log types will come from different connections that we make in regards to Sentinel. Now we haven't done that, we haven't started connecting out to a bunch of uh, resources yet, but once we start making connections, this information gets pulled into this log analytics workspace into these tables, all right? And um, we can control log retention in these tables as well. So if we scroll down, and we take a look at, let's go down here to, so you're going to see a few of these. You'll see things like security alert, security event, security incident, Sentinel audit, Sentinel health. Those are some of the things that pertain to us and what we're talking about right now. Let's look at security event. And if we click the little ellipse symbol there, we're going to go to manage table. And this is where we would control the log retention. Okay. Um, the data retention, log retention data for um, dealing with Sentinel. So the default for that is just 30 days, uh, and that's the interactive retention. That's just interactive is the real-time retention that it's going to allow us just to perform real-time queries right into it. But we can also have that archived for a longer period of time if we want. If we turn this off, okay, we can, we've got this set to 30 days. We could say 60 days if we wanted. It says your workspace is set to 30 days of interactive retention. Selecting a longer retention will incur additional charges. It is telling you that. And then let's say I want to go, you can see it'll let me go all the way up to 12 years as far as doing the, uh, the archive period if I want. So from there, if I wanted to do that, I could then go right here and click save. And I've now... Um, set that retention for a longer period of time. So relatively easy to uh, alter the retention period. Not something I would say very complicated, but that's how we would do that again. Log Analytics Workspace is where everything is going to be stored in regards to Sentinel. 
your tables is where all the data is going to go. You have to make c connections to the various resources to pull all of that in, right? And then when you go into these tables, you can adjust the uh, retention settings by going into that little ellipse symbol and um, uh, adjusting it there. Okay, you can you have those two little intervals you can set it to. Now you can see when that's uh, done processing, you can see right here how it's adjusted. Now I'm actually going to change that back uh, to the default uh, just because I don't want to incur the extra charges, but um, I did want to show you how to do that. So ultimately though, as you can see, those that's pretty easy to handle and, um, and uh, pretty easy to utilize. Let's talk now about data connectors and trying to identify um, what data connectors we're going to utilize and how all that's going to work and uh, understand some of the considerations involved there. So the first thing to understand, of course, is the idea of a data connector is that we have a method in which Sentinel establishes a connection with whatever service it is that's generating this data. So if you think about it, if you take something like um, like Office 365, which has all sorts of logging data that it's keeping, or Azure, which has all sorts of logging data that's keeping, or um, in Microsoft Intune, uh, which has all sorts of logging data. You have to have um, some kind of connection between those services and Sentinel in order for uh, that data, that logging data, to be funneled into Sentinel's workspace so that you can uh, utilize it. And that's called ingestion. Okay, so the idea is to ingest that data. And um, once that gets ingested, it can be normalized, meaning it can be put in a format that's easy to understand. And the thing to remember here is that uh, all of that data is in various formats. Um, it's in the native format that it was generated in. And so the, the problem you run into is if you were trying to view uh, let's say you're 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 investigating an attack uh, or some kind of a threat, and you've got all these log entries, but they're in the various formats that they were generated in. That's kind of a pain, right? That doesn't work very well. But that's the beauty of all this. It's going to ingest it. It's going to normalize it. It's going to put it in a in a central format that's easy to understand. Okay. So the data connector though is going to establish that connection, ingest that data, and then um, allow us to to go through it. And of course. Um, it works with all these cloud sources that you see here. So you'll see, and this is just a few, by the way, this is always changing. Um, you know, so just be aware that this list is always growing. This is by far not the, there are actually hundreds and hundreds of data sources, hundreds and hundreds, just so you know. This is just giving you an example, but you know, you've got these cloud-based ones like Office 365, You've got the Azure uh, infrastructure as a service. You've got the platform as a service in Azure. You've got security alerts that Microsoft generates. You've got Intune, Microsoft Defender. Okay, you've got um, third-party cloud, AWS. You know the software as a service apps that are out there, and then you've even got on-premise capabilities here as well. Okay, so Palo Alto Checkpoint, Cisco. Linux, Windows, you name it. All of that, uh, all of these various items that you see here can support uh, data connections. Of course, you can also f manually upload um, you know, files as well, but for the most part, even if you've got an older technology, uh, the great thing about it is, generally speaking, there's usually some kind of an agent software that can be installed that will allow a data connection to be created. Uh, a lot of these technologies support REST API, Representational State Transfer Application Programming Interface. So it's literally just a link, you know, that can be uh, copied and pasted in and it'll establish connection. But push comes to shove, you'll have an agent and that agent can establish, you know, the connection with that uh, on-premise environment into the cloud. Okay, or even, you know, in the cloud, if it's already natively in the cloud with Sentinel. So, you know, that's the thing to be aware of. You have agent-based, you have agent-less based, 
There are, um, you can, again, manually, if you were dealing with some crazy situation, like, well, imagine you're in, like, a military environment, and it's an air-gapped network, and you uh, you had to manually move data from a network. Maybe you're dealing with, like, a syslog, system log type scenario. You can do that as well, all right? Or if it's in what we call the CEF, the Common Event Format, that is supported as well. Okay, Microsoft Sentinel is going to support that also. Another thing is, is what if your organization has a custom line of business application that they've created that generates logs? Well, as long as that can be put in something like a comma-separated comma value format, like a spreadsheet type format, that could be ingested as well. So it's very, very flexible. It's got a lot of support. For being able to uh, ingest data with these data connections and uh, have some type of method for getting data into the cloud. I now want to go in and I want to take a look at the various data connectors that are available for us in regards to Microsoft Sentinel and we're going to go ahead and make some connections. So here we are on portal.azure.com. Click the menu button and go to all services. I'm just going to search for Sentinel and there it is, Microsoft Sentinel. All right, we'll go ahead and click on that, and then we will go into our Microsoft Sentinel environment. So here we are inside Microsoft Sentinel. Now, I'll also tell you, Microsoft's made some changes uh, to uh, to the way this uh, works. It used to be you'd go under configuration and go to data connectors, and you'd have all of your connectors listed here. And some of their older documentation may still reference this. That's why I wanted to kind of bring it up. But Microsoft's now moved all of this to something called Content Hub. And um, so if we go right here to Content Hub, which is under Content Management, this is where you're going to actually see uh, all of the data connectors. So you can see all these uh, possible solutions for data connectors. Now, the other thing to understand is not all of these are Microsoft. Some of these are third party. Okay, You'll see that you can filter right here you got you can filter based on status based on installed non installed update preview new featured you got content uh, so what kind of content you're looking for analytics rules data connector uh, hunting query parser I understand you might not know what some of this stuff is right now but that's okay um, you've got support so if I want to see just Microsoft I could turn off every one of these except Microsoft and it would show me just the uh, the Microsoft based ones, okay? I could just search based on that if I want to, but I am going to leave all turned on in my case. All right, provider, you can choose a specific provider you're looking for. You've got categories, and then you can look at content sources if it's considered what's called a solution or what's known as a standalone. All right. Um, so a few things we're going to look at. The first thing I want to do is I want to put in the word uh, train. And there's a nice one in here called Microsoft Sentinel Training Lab, which is great because it's going to pull some good data in for us that we can play around with. It's perfect for an environment that really doesn't have a lot going on, like a lab environment. It's perfect for that. So if we look at that, you can see right here, this is Microsoft Sentinel Solution is currently in public preview. So you can see that this is in public preview. But if we go down, uh, there may be known issues. They warn you about that. The training lab help, helps you get ramped up with Sentinel, providing hands-on practical uh, experience. They even provide a step-by-step -step training guide that I can open up. It's a little GitHub uh, thing here I can look at, but not going to jump into that right now. Anyway, I can scroll down, I can see some of the various things, solution ingest pre-recorded data into your Sentinel's workspace, enable several artifacts to simulate scenarios, showcase various Microsoft C, uh, Sentinel features, size of ingestion, they mentioned that. All right, some of the solutions, you'll get parsers, workbooks, analytic rules, hunting queries, playbooks. So this is really perfect for what we are doing. So yes, we're going to go ahead and install that. All right. So here it is. We're going to click to create. All right. And as far as resource group goes, I'm going to just tie this to my, keep in mind, you may not see that if you're doing this with me, you may not see the same resource groups as me. The only one that matters for me is the one called Sentinel RG. 
um, and that's the one I'm choosing. And then for workspace, I'm gonna go with my Sentinel Log workspace. I'm gonna click Review and Create. All right, and I think everything else is good, and we'll go ahead and click to Create. So that's now been submitted. And we're gonna go ahead and let that get installed. Now what I'm also gonna do, I'm gonna go back over to Sentinel. So menu button, all services, Sentinel. All right, go back into it here. I'm gonna go back over to Content Hub. And I want to do this one here, Azure Active Directory. So if we look at that, it tells you this is going to connect to Azure Active Directory. So various things here. If I click, oh, by the way, another thing to, of note is to pay attention to whether or not this is free or not. A lot of the connectors are free. Some of them do cost. Mostly the ones that cost, though, are going to be like the third-party ones. Uh, if I click on View Details, you can see information about this. Um, the idea of this is it's going to establish a connection with your Azure Active Directory so it can pull in things like the uh, the Azure Active Directory sign-in logs. Keep in mind that uh, Azure Active Directory is now called Intra-ID. At any moment, this is going to get changed in Sentinel. In fact, you could be watching this video right now and Microsoft uh, could have switched this over. So be advised that when you're uh, doing this, it may not be called Azure Active Directory anymore on the screen. It may be called Intra ID. Okay. And of course, I do update my, I try to update my videos often, but this is a never ending battle between me and Microsoft. It is like week after week after week, they change the names of things. So just be aware of that. Um, so, I'm, so I can select that one if I want. I'm going to go ahead and do Azure Activity as well. And I'm going to do DNS Essentials also. And um, how about network essentials um, and then security threat essentials all right and so again if I want to if I want to know more about those I can click those and see more information this is they tell you this is a domain name solution does not include any data connectors it tells you the content is a solution requires one of the uh, product solutions below that's when you start getting into domain naming uh, connections and all of that. But I'm going to establish that connection because it would it's great if you are using any of these products. And plus, I just want to have some more connections to take a play around with if I want. And then down here, let's see. Oh, yeah. We'll, we'll, before I select all these, I want to explain it. So we'll go over here to Network uh, Essentials now. So they tell you here. All right, they tell you this is a domain solution, doesn't include any connectors either, but you install one or more of these, which um, like Microsoft Defender and all of that stuff, that's when this is going to come in handy. So um, it'll it'll link in regards to to those and play a role in that and provide some additional rules and all that. So that's why I want that. And then we got security threat. Tell you it's published by Microsoft it's based on continuous evaluation of Microsoft threat campaigns. It provides out of the box security content, so audit logs, Azure Activity, all that good stuff. So we want all of that. So I'm going to go ahead and reselect those again: security threat essentials, uh, network, DNS, and Azure Activity, and Azure Active Directory. We're going to go ahead and click install. Oh, and it just dawned on me. I clicked install down here. Actually, we want to click install up here. So Let's just make sure we got everything selected again. All right. Yeah, there we go. All right, so we're going to click install right here. Now that'll install all the items. Okay, so now I'm just going to go ahead and pause this recording while that's getting installed. Okay, so the uh, most of the connectors got installed relatively quick. Now you will notice that um, the lab one that got installed that one took I would say maybe 15 minutes or so so just be advised that um, if you did install the lab thing in your own environment then it's gonna take some time if you didn't install it that's fine you just watching along that's totally fine as well just letting you know alright 
So that's it. We've got our data connector set up. Now be advised before we start really ingesting data and all that, it can take some time. This can take five minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, could take up to an hour. Um, just be aware of that. This, if you got a, a trial tenant environment, can take a little bit longer sometimes. And uh, so we do have to sometimes give this some time. But we do got a data, data connector set up and we're ready to move on. All right, now I want to connect with Microsoft 365 Defender as well as Defender for Cloud. Uh, now, before we connect with Defender for Cloud, I want to uh, go into that. So I'm going to click the menu button, go to All Services, and I'm just going to search for Defender. And I'm going to click Microsoft Defender for Cloud. That's going to bring me into that. And I want to go right here to Security Alerts. And um, in my case, I've actually already done this. But if, uh, if this is something you haven't already done, I want to make sure that I've installed my sample alerts. So we'll click to install these sample alerts, create the sample alerts, and um, give that some time to get created. And then at that point, we're good to go, okay? And um, as far as Microsoft 365 Defender is concerned, we need to make sure that we have um, Defender licensing and all of that. Um, if we got like Microsoft 365 E5 and all that, we're good. I'm not gonna dive into the licenses on that, but um, that's something that could be looked up if you needed to. All right. So, um, but for Sentinel, I don't, I don't need any, you know, I don't really have to have a special license for Sentinel, but I do have to have the Defender uh, licenses for uh, supporting it. As far as Microsoft 365 Defender in, involves being able to ingest data. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to the menu button, go to All Services, and we'll go to Sentinel. All right, and then we'll go right here into our Sentinel workspace. And I'm going to scroll down to Content Hub. All right, and we're going to just search for the keyword Defender. And I'm going to install the Microsoft 365 Defender connector here, which is going to pull, as you can see, all the security alert data for the Microsoft 365 Defender suite. And then also Microsoft Defender for Cloud. So we're going to go ahead and get both of those. All right, and I'm going to click Install, Update, and uh, start letting that get installed. So I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording while that's being installed. All right, it doesn't take very long. We've now got uh, both of those added. Uh, both of those should be connected. Got the little check marks next to it, so we are good to go on that. Just remember that this can take a while before the information will start showing up. It can take 15 minutes, it can take 30 minutes, it can take an hour, it just depends on uh, the services. Microsoft um, trial tenants can sometimes take longer than others before things are fully up and running. So just be aware of that. And uh, now that we've got those connected, we are ready to move on. I now want to talk about the design and setup configuration of syslog and CEF format. Now, uh, I got a nice little design image up on the screen for you. I want to show you kind of where this comes from. If you actually go out to Google or Bing and just search for common event format collection in uh, Azure Sentinel, there is a article here, best practices for this. And we can click on that article and this is where we'll come across this little design. So if we take kind of a, a close look, we know that, that Syslog, Syslog is probably one of the oldest formats ever to uh, to be out in our various systems. It's very popular in Unix and Linux, but that's not the only place it's used. It's used in all sorts of different um, pieces of hardware and software. But uh, ultimately, Syslog um, you know, could be utilized in various appliances, IoT, whatever it may be. And you can use a log forwarder. You could even have a, a central VM that just kind of forwards all the logs from one place, or you could have an agent on each um, device that's collecting everything and sending it to Sentinel. Okay, and um, from there it gets put in that CEF format. Okay, uh, and so and the nice thing about that, that common event format, is it's a normalized format that's easy to understand and uh, easy to control. Most of your SIM type softwares out there are going to utilize this format anyway. So if you're collecting log data from some other 
sim formatted uh, device or piece of software, it's probably already going to be in CEF, but with syslog, it can be formatted and normalized in CEF. But as you can see here, you can have on-prem. This is a pretty common design. You have on-prem, syslog, default port 514, happening over UDP, TCP, TLS, uh, being transmitted across the internet over REST API um, 443, TLS encryption. And you could have a Linux box here. You could have Linux VM. It could be communi communicating to that. Maybe this is a could be an IoT device, something out in the field, whatever, sending data. Or you could have this device talk directly with Azure. So that's just one example of a design. You could have a design where it's talking directly with Azure. Okay, let me sh show you how we could set up the data connector now. So if I go back, if I go over to portal.azure.com, click the menu button, go to all services. I'm just going to search for Sentinel. We'll go to Microsoft Sentinel, open this up. All right, and then I'm going to go uh, down here to, let me get to the right place here. Okay, I'm going to go down here to Content Hub. All right, and uh, if we, uh, we'll just search for Syslog first and um, scroll down and you're going to see the common event format. So you'll see that right here. So solution for Microsoft Sentinel allows you to ingest logs from any product and any appliance it sends in the common event format. So we'll select that one. And then I can uh, keep scrolling and I will see Microsoft Sysmon for Linux. So I'm going to select that one as well. And uh, this tells you your Sysmon for Linux provides detailed information about process creation, network connections, other system events, the Sysmon for Linux. Connector uses syslog as its data ingestion, all right? And you can even, if I right click here and say open up details, um, we can view the details of that right here, okay? And so they tell you that uh, the underlying technology is used, it's just an agent-based log collection. And I can learn more about that, learn more about Sentinel, the solutions, or learn more about the syslog right here. And you'll see the uh, information here, collect data from Linux-based sources for the syslog, and they kind of show you another little visual here, representation from a Linux box. You got your syslog source happening over the 514, the syslog daemon. UDP 25224 log analytics agent you can grab that and send that data into the Sentinel workspace. All right, so I'm going to jump back over here. We've got the uh, Microsoft Sysmon for Linux selected and the common event format selected. And I'm going to go right up here and click uh, install update. And we're going to let both of those uh, data connectors get installed. Usually doesn't take too long. To, um, to get those installed. Okay, and then uh, once that's done, we should be able to notice there's a little checkbox here. And uh, we can jump right over here to data connectors under configuration and we can see that we have uh, that installed. So there is our Microsoft Sysmon for Linux and uh, the common event format that you'll see there. Um, You'll see Microsoft's kind of phasing out one of the older, the legacy, what they call the legacy agent, and they're moving into the Azure Monitor agent. They're moving away from what's called the Log Analytics agent. They're retiring that, and they're moving into the Azure Monitor agent. But um, right down here, if we look at Sysmon for Linux, we can click on that and click on Open Connectors page. And this is how we would install it. All we have to do is um, go right here if we want to install the connector. If uh, the machine is a virtual machine in Azure, you can very easily go right here. It tells you you can just download and install the agent for the Azure virtual machine. You could select it if you wanted and away you go. Okay. Um, and if I wanted to install non-Azure Linux virtual machine. I can download the agent right here and uh, I can install the agent software into that device. Okay, right here.
so here is the uh, the information about doing that so download it and then when I install it in Linux it's gonna ask for this key information and I can plug that in which I'm not gonna get into right now but that's how we can go about doing that alright so pretty straightforward that is how we can could go through the process of setting up um, the uh, format for if we were dealing with say a Linux machine involving CEF um, syslog that's how we would uh, get that going and we got our data connectors and that's what we wanted to do in this video I now want to talk about how uh, Microsoft Sentinel can grab Windows security event information um, so I want to look at first we'll talk about some of the design and then we'll uh, look at how it would get implemented um, here's a little graphic now you can find this if you go to Google or Bing and just search for Windows events to Sentinel and there is this little article right here, Forward uh, On-Premise Windows Security Event. So the first thing to be aware of here is that, you know, uh, in the older methods for this, for quite a while now, we've been able to have, using group policies and all that on-premise, we could have events that could be collected on our various desktop machines and all of that. And um, we could have one machine collecting events to other machines and, uh, and all of that fun stuff. And... Um, we can control the the policies and all of that using group, or we can control the settings using group policies in an on-premise environment. And uh, we may still need to do that if we're doing this with a lot of like Windows client machines or something like that. We need to be able to collect data from these machines. Okay. And so this little article here kind of walks through the fact that you know you might have to do that with GPS, but I wouldn't worry about having to like memorize the settings or any of that. What What's most important to get across here is this graphic here, and that is the main design of this is we can have, um, in the case of this, it's showing the server, but you actually could have client machines that your data is being collected from as well directly, uh, and that information is being collected into the log analytics workspace, which of course links to Microsoft Sentinel. So. Your collected security events from clients um, can be forwarded from a central server or they can be forwarded directly. You know, in a very large environment, it probably is going to make sense to set up a central server that's going to uh, receive the events from a bunch of client machines and then go from go to the log analytics uh, workspace. However, if you're in, in also in a lot of environments, it might just be that you are collecting information from um, your uh, just your servers and then also I want to mention one other design of this and this is sort of like moving into the future and this is this is kind of the way Microsoft is really looking at it now what they really want everybody doing is they want everybody using Microsoft Defender for Endpoint and Microsoft Defender for Endpoint can tie to Sentinel so if you're using Microsoft Defender for Endpoint Microsoft Defender for Endpoint is going to be collecting security events anyway and it can deliver everything to Sentinel, and it's going to alleviate you from having to set all this up. So just so you know, this is really the older design, and you can still do it, um, especially if you're in an environment that has older devices that don't support Defender for Endpoint. But nowadays, the newer way to consider to do this would be to use Defender for Endpoint. All right. All right, so let's look at the data connector and all that that we would use. So let's go over to portal.azure.com, click the menu button, go to All Services, and then we're going to just search for Sentinel. We'll go into Microsoft Sentinel. Okay, we'll open this up and we're going to go down to um, our Content Hub. And we'll just search for Windows Security. And we should see, there it is right there, Windows Security Events. So we'll select that. And you can see the information here it mentions about this. All right, I can even click on, let me just right click and open in a new tab. Go and look at the details of this. All right, uh, so we'll just go ahead and let that load up. It talks about the, um, the newer method, which is the Windows Security Events for the Azure Monitor agent versus the older, which was the legacy agent. The Log Analytics agent is what it was using. All right, it tells you that you can learn more this little article here about Sentinel if you want, about its solutions and all that fun stuff. It also talks about learn more about the ingesting user, the, the uh, monitoring agent here. So they're going to provide you with the 
AMA connector data and here is an example of the design of that so this is just showing the Linux box but it really kind of works the same with Windows it's just Windows event log data as opposed to syslog okay so anyway we'll come back over here now and we're gonna go ahead and install that so we'll click install and I'm gonna pause the recording while that's getting installed okay so it doesn't take very long to get that uh, connection installed there that connector installed now we'll go over here to data connectors and uh, we might have to click refresh but we should be able to scroll down and see yeah there it is Windows security events we're gonna click on that and we're gonna open the connector page all right and once we get into the connector page we're gonna create a, a data collection rule and we're gonna click to create that rule and uh, I actually have a virtual machine called NYC CL1 it's running Windows 11 in Azure and I've already started it now if you were doing this with me you'd have to make sure you've got that set up and started uh, and I'm gonna create a rule now the rule name can't have any any hyphens or any of that so unfortunately you can't call this like NYC dash CL1 rule or something because you're gonna get an error if you do and it tells you right here you know you can't have any you can't have um, can't have any uh, spaces or any of that. you can't have dashes and all that so that's okay I'm gonna call this um, NYCCL1 uh, collection dash rule. All right, and then uh, resource group will be a Sentinel. That's fine. We'll click next, and then uh, I've got this RG demo, and that's where my NYCCL1 is. I'm going to click that. I'm just going to say collect everything. Obviously, you could be you could do custom if you wanted, minimum, common. Uh, and they kind of break that down for you. All events common is a standard set of events for auditing. Minimum is a small set of events that might indicate potential threats and then custom allows you to filter. I'm gonna say all. So then we'll click review and create and then we're gonna click to create. And at that point it is now going to do that. And there you go. Um, it's now gonna start collecting those events and um, I might sound like a broken record but you do gotta be patient with Sentinel. This could take 15 minutes, it could take 30 minutes, it could take an hour, and I've even, with Windows, I've even seen it take longer than that before things start showing up. But um, we've now set up our data collector for uh, our Windows security machine, our Windows device, and uh, we are ready to move on. Oh, and actually, before I move on, I did want to say this. Uh, they tell you right here to collect data from non-Azure VMs. They must have the, uh, the Azure Arc installed. So um, you can set up the Azure Arc. That's the that's basically the server that you can set up on premise that'll establish a connection. But um, as I've already stated, in the real world, what you know what Microsoft really wants everybody doing nowadays. This is kind of what I would say you need to remember is that um, they want everybody using Defender for Endpoint and Defender for Endpoint because pretty much all the newer Windows machines already has. The Defender software, they'll the Defender endpoint will just automatically collect event data, and then that can be delivered into Sentinel. But anyway, that is um, where you can learn more about the the Azure Arc and all of that. But all right, now we're ready to move on. I now want to get into how we can set up threat intelligence connectors. Now, first off, there's a couple of acronyms that uh, I want to talk about if you're not familiar with them. The first being what is called sticks sticks is the structured threat information expression now if you're not familiar with sticks sticks is a uh, essentially a language that was created by a company called oasis and uh, the goal of this is to allow organizations to create a threat intelligence database that uses a common language and it also allows companies and various organizations to share their findings with each other so it's not like a, a CVE database where there is just like one overall a database that everybody uh, in the world sort of uses but it is a with sticks it's a lots of databases out there that people can share information around if they want now the the catch to that is you gotta have some kind of a uh, protocol that allows your technologies to exchange information with sticks and that technology is called taxi uh, T-A-X-I-I -I, which is trusted automated exchange intelligence information 
So you have sticks, which is structured threat information expression, and you have taxi, which is trusted automated exchange of intelligent information. Those are your sort of your concepts there. And of course, um, taxi again is the protocol that communicates across using this uh, this uh, language. Okay. So with that said, uh, let's jump into Azure and take a look at a few things. So here we are on portal.azure.com. Okay, I'm going to click the menu button, go to all services, and we'll go right here. And we're just going to search for Sentinel. We'll go into Microsoft Sentinel and open up our little Sentinel workspace here. And then we're going to scroll down and go to Content Hub. And we're going to search for the keyword threat. All right, so we'll look for threat and... Let's see, there it is, Threat Intelligence. That's the one we want. So we're gonna go ahead and click to install that. And when that's done, we're gonna go over here to Data Connectors. And we should, we might have to click Refresh, but we should be able to see, there it is, Threat Intelligence Taxi. If we click on that, we can click Open Connectors page. And this is where it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, we actually have to have a service that is providing uh, the taxi data, the sticks data, and um, there's a, a free one that you can utilize to play around with here. It's uh, it's called PulseDive.com, so P-U-L-S-E-D-I-V-E.com, and I'm just going to go there and I'm going to create an account, so I'm going to register with them. I'm just going to use my little uh, tenant email address to, uh, to set this up, and so we'll go ahead and register. All right, and then it's I'm gonna go into my email and agree to the terms here. So just doing that real quick. All right, you could you could tie this really to any email you want, but I'm gonna tie it to my tenant email here. So we'll go back over here and. Click the registration link. There we go. Verifying link. Um, username. I'm just going to put JC Exam Lab Practice. And then a password that I'm going to remember. Okay. Job title, all right, and register. So username must be between five and 15 characters. I think I got too many characters there. Let me just drop the JC off of it. There we go. All right, and then I'm gonna log in, sign in. And we've now got the account set up. Okay, so now what I want to do is um, I am going to go back over here to um, start filling this form out. It's asking me about friendly name and, uh, for server, and I'm just going to put on here, I'll call it Pulse Feed. And it's asking me for an API root key now, a root URL. Now you have to do a little searching on their website to find this, but they tell you what the API root URL is going to be http colon slash slash pulse com slash taxi two slash api slash so that's what you'd have to type in for that the collection id um kind of have to dig for that but if we go over here and we expand out sticks and we go and look at their collections um, we're going to pull the test data and this is their collection id for that so i'm going to copy that all right and i'm going to paste that in and then for username, we're going to put taxi2. Uh, one of the mistakes a lot of people make here is they actually try to use the username from the website, and that's not correct. You actually have to put taxi2 there, T-A-X-I-I-2. And then the password will actually be the, the API key. So we'll come back over here, and I want to go to this API area, and I'm going to copy this key. Now, by the way, if for some reason that key is not there, we can go to our account and we're going to see our key right here as well. So I'll go back over there. I'm just going to paste that in, and we're going to go ahead and click Add. 
All right, so this is going to take a while. Uh, this is one of those things that um, can definitely take a while to get added. It could take up to an hour. But there we go. We've actually officially now uh, added a threat intelligence database. It's all linked up, and uh, we're now ready to move on. So let's say we wanted to pull some custom data from something, like let's say maybe it's a web service or something along those lines. It could even be an older web service that uh, doesn't traditionally connect to a SIEM or SIM type service. And we would like to have a custom table created in our log analytics workspace for Sentinel for collecting data. I'd like to show you how we could go about doing that. Uh, now, the first thing we go, we're going to need is um, we are going to have to go through and take a look at our uh, log analytics workspace. So we're going to go here on portal.azure.com, click the menu button, go to all services, and we're just going to search for uh, log analytics, and we'll go into log analytics workspace. Click on our Sentinel workspace. We're going to go to tables, and we would go right here to create a new custom table, or custom log, I should say, which is basically going to have a place for us to store it. Now, one thing I want to show you right out of the gates when we go here is um, we can fill all this out, but we won't have what's called a data collection endpoint. So we need one of those. Um, that's going to basically create this uh, endpoint service in Azure that can link um, as like a URL for the REST API, representational state transfer, to basically link between whatever the service is that uh, we're trying to communicate with. If it's a web service, it's going to link to that and then link back to this log analytics workspace. But we got to create that first. So. Um, Let's go, and we're going to do that, and you kind of have to do that in a weird place. You have to click the menu button and go down to Monitor. This is the Azure Monitor. We're going to scroll down in Azure Monitor. We're going to look down here towards the bottom. We're going to look for Data Collection Endpoints, and we're going to click Create. And Resource Groups, I'm just going to store this in my um, Sentinel RG, and I'm going to give this endpoint a name. I'm just going to call this... Um, we will call it custom log site demo okay and then we'll click review and create and we'll click to create okay so that gives us a takes a moment to create that but um, our little endpoint should get created after a while it may take a little while to show up here let's go now and we'll click the menu button we'll go to all services and we're going to search for log analytics workspace again and we'll go into our log analytics workspace we're going to open up sentinel log workspace and then i'm going to go back to tables and we're going to click to create a new custom log dcr format all right give it a name I'm just going to call this um, custom log demo all right and we now are going to have to create what's called a data collection rule. So we're going to click to create that. And it's going to store it in the resource group East US for me. Give it a name. I'm going to call this custom log rule demo. Click done. And then there is our endpoint that's now showing up. We did create our endpoint. So we'll click next on that. And then it says, please upload a sample of logs in JSON format. You can drag and drop that right here. So if I go out to Google or Bing and I just do a quick search on JSON sample Sentinel log analytics file, there's a nice little GitHub sample data here. And I can click on that. And it uh, gives me this option here for downloading this raw file. Uh, raw code, um, or I can copy this. If I want to copy this, a uh, little JSON file here. So I'm just going to go right here. I'm going to copy this and save it to a notepad file. All right. I'm just going to save this as sample.json. 
Okay, jumping back over here now, I'm going to browse to that file. And it's going to throw a little bit of an error because one of the things that Microsoft's Log Analytics requires is a field in JSON for every entry labeled time generated. And if we look at our file, you'll notice that we don't have a uh, entry in the JSON file called uh, time generated. Actually, we do have this TS field, which is the equivalent of that, but it's not time generated. If we actually read what the learn article tells us, it tells us all about that, that we have to have that time genera generated field. So what we're going to do is we're just going to fix our little, I'm just going to fix my little text file to say time generated right here. And um, I could obviously just do replace the replace option, but I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to save that now, and I'm going to uh, re-upload it. So we'll go back here to, uh, to um, upload the sample file. Okay, so as you can see, it went through successfully this time. And now I'm just going to go ahead and click Next. We're going to click uh, Create. And we've now uh, gone through the process of creating that custom table. All right, so pretty straightforward. We've uh, we've got our little custom table created there, and we should be able to see it if we scroll up and look for custom. Oh, there it is, right there, custom log demo. So we can click on that. We can see that right here. Uh, we've got that set up. You've also got the option to click the ellipse symbol, edit the schema if you want. You can see the information that's in it there. Now, also, don't forget that we've got an endpoint for it. So if you were tying to a, like a web service or something and it needed to know the endpoint, that's basically the URL or URI, as it's called sometimes for um, identifying a certain piece of information. You can go and get that by clicking the menu button and going to monitor, scrolling back down and going to data collection endpoints. And then there it is right there. And then, as you can see, here is the information on it. So this is the actual uh, endpoint information, log ingestion, ingestion and all that, which I'm not going to dive deep into that right now, but at least now we know how to create that custom table and how all that's going to work for us. I now want to help you understand the concepts of Sentinel Analytics rules. So what is the purpose of Sentinel Analytics rules? So, the idea here being that these are going to be something that Microsoft has implemented for helping us detect potential security threats and various anomalies uh, in our environment. So the, the, you know, the goal with Microsoft Sentinel being that we're going to collect all this vast amount of information and then be able to actually detect threats, right? These rules are going to help us with identifying the various types of suspicious activities that are going on, unusual patterns, known attack techniques, and uh, any other types of IOCs, IOC being indicators of compromise. So we have different types of uh, analytic rules, the first being what's called a scheduled query rule. So this is going to let us use what's called KQL, the Custo Query Language, or Custo Query Language, however you like to say it. And uh, the idea being there is that um, the uh, KQL can query at specific intervals and look for patterns and anomalies, and then from there look at threat signatures and uh, specific, uh, suspicious behaviors and all of that, and then based on that detect what the, the various threats could be. All right. Next, we have the Microsoft Incident Creation Rule. These are just automatically generated uh, incidents from the Microsoft 365 uh, Defender Alerts. So these are just going to be automatically created based on Defender. Then you got Fusion Rules. So these are going to use machine learning to correlate and merge low fidelity, desperate uh, alerts into high fidelity incidents. Uh, ultimately, one of the big things about Fusion is that it's for multi-stage attacks. What's great about that is uh, it will uh, analyze various places all at once to see uh, if an attack started in one place and ended in another place. So, you know, in a scenario where attacker is trying various things and attacking various things, probing at weaknesses, this is where Fusion is going to be helpful. 
Then we got the ML behavior uh, analytic rule, that's machine learning behavior analytics rules. This is going to let us use advanced machine learning to identify various types of unusual behaviors that may might deviate from a, a type of pattern, a traditional pattern. Then the last one is uh, NRT analytics rules, that's near real-time analytics rules. So this is a type of rule that's designed to detect threats and uh, generate alerts very, very rapidly almost in real time. Um, the goal being that this can generate an alert um, just as soon as, as a event is ingested into the system. All right, so this is sort of like your, your trigger alarm, if you will, that's gonna, gonna go off immediately as opposed to a bunch of scanning that's got to happen like some of the other types of rules. So we also have customization and configuration. So that's the other thing to be aware of. You can have custom, customized rules and all of that. So, um, you know, when you have a security team, they can create custom analytics rules tailored to their specific environment and security needs. Um, and the rules can be configured based on various parameters, based on severity level, uh, event frequencies, as well as they can even set uh, types of threshold conditions that they want to look at. Then you got response automation, alerts, and incidents. So the response automation side of this is where, with our analytics rules, um, this is all going to be integrated with automated responses. And of course, the automated responses are called uh, playbooks in uh, in Microsoft Sentinel. And uh, the playbooks are you uh, utilize Microsoft's Azure Logic Apps platform. So it's a Logic Apps resource that's going to automate the task. Uh, when the rule gets triggered. So then you've also got alerts and incidents. When an analytic rule is triggered, it can generate an alert. Um, the alerts can be aggregated into incidents. So we can actually go step by step and see what the incident was, which could have generated a bunch of, of alerts as well. And then that gives an opportunity for us to investigate and provide a response. Uh, of course, we also have automated response. And the last thing here is continuous improvement. Um, with these analytic rules, they're constantly being reviewed by Microsoft and um, they're being modified. They're, they're modifying these based on the threat landscape. So as you can imagine, this is a never ending ongoing battle between uh, the cybersecurity professionals out there and the hackers that are out there. So the, the uh, offense versus the defense or the, you know, the white hat, black hat hacking is going on and then ultimately they're constantly trying to improve and make things better okay and uh, so Microsoft met likes to make that clear they do have continuous improvement going on all right and it's gonna help maintain effectiveness over time all right well hopefully this helps you have a, a nice general understanding of the the purpose of these rules that we're going to be using uh, in regards to Microsoft Sentinel I now want to take a look at the Microsoft Fusion Analytics rule in Sentinel. So here we are on portal.azure.com. If we click the menu button and go to all services, we can just search for Sentinel. We can open up Microsoft Sentinel then, click on the Sentinel workspace, and we're going to scroll down under the configuration area and go to analytics. And this is where our analytics rules are uh, going to be handled. So you're going to notice that if we look right here under this advanced multi-stage attack detection. Okay, this is where our fusion rule is already actually configured. Okay, so Microsoft already has fusion, this advanced multi-stage attack um, detection fusion rule already going in our environment. Okay, uh, if I go right here, I can click the ellipse symbol and uh, click edit and I can see information about this particular rule. All right, so it says analytics rule wizard edit existing fusion rule. So this is a fusion rule. All right, tells you some information about it. Only thing it's going to let me do in this case is if I wanted to disable it, that's one type of configuration I could do. I could just disable it, but I don't want to disable it. But let's go over here to configure uh, fusion and as you can see, I have the all these various types of uh, statuses turned on for these various uh, uh, products and services. 
This is one of the reasons they call it fusion because it's fusion. It's fusing together all these various products. So you have all the the intra ID protection, defender, all these defender products uh, involved. You can um, also go over here and adjust the alert statuses. So whether you just want informational messages, low, medium, high, you can turn those on or off if you want. Okay. Um, so that's also pretty neat. Okay, so if we go over here to automation, this is where you would configure the SOAR side of this. So the, um, you know, this gets into the security operation automation response side of things, which I'm not going to be diving into in this video, but this is where you would do that. Okay, so um, not, not, not getting into that in this video, but that's where you would handle that. And then we can click review and create. And at that point, we would save any changes. And it gives a summary of, of what's going to happen. By the way, we can see the tactics and techniques that it's analyzing. So these are the various things that Fusion is, uh, is actually analyzing. And so, of course, Fusion is something Microsoft has put out. This is not a custom analytics uh, rule. That's why we can't customize everything about it. We can only utilize the stuff that Microsoft has provided us with. And again, if we do want to configure more of the options, we can we essentially can turn things on and off here if we want, check the severity levels we want, or if we want to turn the whole thing off, we can do that. Okay. And that and uh, the last thing, of course, is handling the automation. So those are the configuration tasks that we can uh, perform when it comes to managing uh, the fusion rule, which is a multi-stage attack in Microsoft Sentinel. I now want to take a look at creating a security analytics rule in Sentinel. So here we are on portal.azure.com. We're going to click the menu button and go to all services. And then we'll just search for Sentinel and we'll go into Microsoft Sentinel, click on the workspace, and here we are. We'll scroll down and we're going to look under right here where it says uh, configuration and go to analytics. And this is where we're going to create our little rule. So we'll go right here to create, and we're going to create uh, what is called a Microsoft Incident Creation Rule. Not getting into these other two in this video, but I'll go to Microsoft Incident Creation Rule. All right. And uh, so the idea here being that this is going to let us create a rule that is going to be looking at incidents and then generating alerts. And it, of course, could also automate a response if uh, need be. Okay, so we'll just give this a name. I'll just call this incident rule demo. Actually, we'll call it incident demo rule. All right. And then it will already be enabled. Okay. Uh, ask for an analytics rule logic if we have that. And I could have this based on any of these here. So if it was Microsoft Defender for Cloud Apps, for Cloud, Defender for Identity, Intra ID Protection, Defender for Endpoint. Defender for IoT, Defender for Office 365, Insider Risk Management, or you've got custom, okay, um, custom or any, so you can kind of set that to what you want, all right, okay, so I am going to go with, let's go with Defender for Cloud, and then you could include some specific alerts if there is any that's already uh, generated, says only create incidents from alerts that contain the following text, so you could specify uh, keywords here if you wanted. You could also have excluded uh, keywords if you wanted. Okay, so that would be, that's sort of the idea there. All right. Um, or you, again, you could do a custom, but I'm not going to do a custom in this. We'll link this to Defender for Cloud, right? Um, okay. So include specific alerts, only create uh, incidents from alerts that contain the following text in the alert. All right. Uh, and then if we wanted to do that, we could specify keywords. So then we got our automation. So we could click add on automation. All right. So we'll call this um, automation demo rule. All right, trigger, when incident is created, what do you want to do? When the incident is created or when the incident is updated. So we'll say created. All right, so it has some little conditions right here that are um, showing you. It says if incident provider is equal to all and analytics rule name contains uh, the rules, 
all basically because we didn't spe we haven't specified any keywords or anything. We can also say and we can say and um, we'll say uh, severity is equal to we'll say high. So if it's if this is a incident occurs that is a considered high severity, okay, we could say and go right here and specify a title. Um, we'll say contains the word password. Okay, so if it involves password, we could do that. So action, we could run a playbook, which I'm not getting into in this video. Change the status, change severity, assign to an owner, add tags, add what's called a task. Okay, and uh, I'll say change status. We'll say we'll we'll link this as a new. This is something that's that's new. Um, rule uh, expiration. You could set expiration order priority one. Okay, it'll be high priority and apply that. Now, if we did, if we wanted to go back, I, so, I talked about password. If I wanted to go back and say, okay, well, we'll put the keyword password in there. We can do that. Just hit apply. Okay. And then click next, click review and create, and click save. And at that point, we've now created ourselves a little rule, this incident demo rule that we've now got. All right, so this will generate an alert every time uh, an incident occurs. It's got the word password in it. It's not really going to do much. It's just going to mark it as new. But uh, once you start learning how to work with playbooks and all that, you can get real fancy. But I'm not going to get into that in this video. I now want to take a look at some of the built-in scheduled rules that we have in Microsoft Sentinel, how, how those would be configured. So here we are on portal.azure.com. If we click the menu button, go to All Services, we'll just search for Sentinel. And we'll go to Microsoft Sentinel, open up the workspace. We're going to scroll down under configuration and go to uh, analytics. So from there, we'll be able to see some of the rules that are listed here that are active. These are all active already. I have one that I've created. So that one wasn't just like a built-in one. That was one that I created. Also, um, if I select a rule, I can go over here and click this little uh, arrow and it'll give me some information about each rule that I'm selecting. So this is the fusion rule, for example, and here's one called malicious inbox rule where I can look at and I can scroll down. One thing of note about these uh, built-in scheduled rules is that they uh, automatically utilize the Custo query language, the KQL, for performing the uh, queries that they are performing, all right? Now we can tell that these are scheduled built-in schedule rules, by the way. You see the little clock symbol here. In fact, if we move this over a little bit, you can see those a little easier. So you can see the, the ones here that are scheduled, right? Scheduled based. And they use the Custo query language. You can see the frequency, how frequently they run, the uh, rule period, last th uh, uh, rule period, last 30 minutes data, rule threshold, event grouping, all of that. So you can select uh, these, see information. Here's the sign-in, sign-ins from IPs says uh, sign-ins for IPs that attempt sign-ins to disable accounts. And then, of course, if you want to edit those to do some configuration, you can. You can click Edit. It'll bring you in here. You can adjust the severity level you want to look at. Um, here's some of the tactics and techniques that um, you can uh, add to that or remove if you want. You've got the rule logic over here. This is actually the Custo query that it's performing. So you can manage that if you needed to. You have the incident settings, so create incidents from alerts. You can have alert grouping. It's going to group alerts together. You can limit the group to alerts created uh, within a selected time frame if you want. Uh, you can have grouping alerts into a single uh, incident if you want. Group all alerts triggered by the rule into a single incident. Group alerts into a single incident if the selected uh, entity types and details match certain criteria. And then you can even have reopen close matching incidents if you want. You have automated response. That's where you can start getting into some of the SOAR stuff and all that, which I'm not going to dive into here. And then, of course, you can edit and save the, uh, the rule here. Okay. Uh, you can also go over here to rule templates, and, and of course, you, you could create some of these, uh, some other rules from there. But I'm not going to look at creating a rule from here. I just wanted to look at the ones that were already uh, built in and active. So 
I encourage you, if you are playing around with this, you can jump into your own environment, kind of look at these and explore some of those settings, but it's relatively straightforward. The main thing to remember here is that um, a scheduled rule is something that's going to happen generally on an interval, and it uses that Custo query language for uh, periodically querying for the data that it's looking for. I now want to create a custom scheduled query. So here we are on portal.azure.com. We're going to click the menu button, go to all services, and we'll search for Sentinel. Go right here to Microsoft Sentinel, and then we'll open up the workspace. Once we're in the workspace, we'll scroll down and go to analytics. All right, once we're in analytics, we'll see our various rules and we can go right here to create and we'll click create a scheduled query rule. All right, this little uh, scheduled rule that I'm gonna create is going to look at, um, I'm just gonna use a query that's gonna look for some type of an unknown sign-in attempt. So um, in Microsoft Azure's identity protection, uh, Microsoft uh, Identity Protection has a system, well, it's it's now called Microsoft Intra Identity Protection, but um, in Intra Identity Protection, it has a system for analyzing uh, where users generally sign on from, and if they try to sign in in a location they, they haven't normally signed in from, after, you know, they're used to, it's used to seeing them sign in in a certain place, it will generate an unknown sign-in attempt, and it'll actually use those keywords. So what I'm going to do is use the Custo query language to write a very simple query that's just going to uh, look for those keywords, and uh, we'll go from there. So we'll, we'll just call this, this name will be unknown sign-ins. All right, uh, severity level, we'll just leave that to medium. We'll click go to logic, and then the query is going to look like this right here. All right, so sign-ins sign in logs underscore cl you have you have to kind of learn a little bit about the Custo query language if you were going to write one of these queries right um you can microsoft has lots of documentation out there on this uh you can also I've, i have found that chat gpt can be very helpful for writing helping write Custo query queries if you need something fancy that uh, maybe you can't find on the internet, um, you don't really have to worry about being an expert on the Custo query language uh, for, for all of this. But if you do want something fancy, it does help to go out there and research a little bit, use ChatGPT. But anyway, um, so this is the, the table it's generally going to be looking in, which will involve the identity protection table. And it's basically saying where the result is equal to. And so if it's got these keywords in it, which that's you know, the intra identity protection always will use these keywords if uh, there is a situation where you have a uh, unfamiliar sign in. All right. And uh, so at that point, we could view the query results right now, but we're not going to see anything unless you have a user where who has done that before recently, which you can see I have not. But um, the idea is to make it where it will generate an alert if that happens. So you have scroll down you have alert mapping it says map up to 10 entries uh, recognized by Microsoft Sentinel from the appropriate fields available in the query results this enables Microsoft Sentinel to recognize and classify the data in these fields for further analysis so I could add you know add an entry um, you know so you can kind of scroll down through here you can you can base it on uh, the account information if you want the name information um, you know base it on all these various places that this name could come from if you wanted to all right so lots and lots of uh, of information here I'm gonna put authentication details there but you can add additional identifiers there host IP address if you want um, you know specify that in there if you want um, all of that information custom details so this is if you wanted to assign a what's called a key value pair. So they tell you, uh, it says here you can surface particular event parameters and their values and alerts that uh, comprise. So if, there, if you knew there was a specific piece of information that's always in this type of alert, you could have that generated and specified here as well. Um, alert details, specify some other details about it. It says here you can select parameters in your alert that can be uh, represented in the name or description of each instance of the alert 
or that can contain the tactics and severity assigned. So if you want to specify some additional in details, so for whatever admin is investigating this in the future, you could have some additional details generated here as well. All right, and then from there you have a query scheduling. So this is going to run. You can see every five hours by default, but I'm going to set that to every five minutes. And then look up data from the last, set to every five uh, hours. I'll leave that as the, um, the default there. Start running automatically. You could specify a date time. Remember, this is a scheduled query rule. So that's the point of this. You're scheduling this. Uh, alert threshold, you could have a threshold on how many alerts it will generate. So generate alert when the number of results is greater than zero in this case. Um, but you can say equal to, fewer than, or not equal to. You can also configure alert groups if you want, and group it all together, and or have it separate. All right. You can also have suppression, stop running query after alerts generated if you want. So then you go here, incident settings. It says Microsoft Sentinel alerts can be grouped together into an incident that should be looked into. And so this is going to generate an incident. Here's alert grouping. Again, if you wanted to do alert grouping, okay, that should already be familiar to you. And then if you wanted to do the automated uh, response, you can do that as well. That gets into SOAR and all that, which I'm not getting into in this video. But from there, I can click Review and Create. It's going to validate it, and then I'm going to click Save. And I have now officially created my little scheduled rule. All right, so that has been set up, and uh, that is how you can create a scheduled query rule. Let's take a look now at how we can configure a NRT rule, uh, analytics rule, also known as a near real-time analytics rule. Here we are on portal.azure.com. We're going to click the menu button, go to all services. We will search for Sentinel, open up Microsoft Sentinel, go into the workspace, and we're going to scroll down under configuration and look for analytics. Now we're going to be able to go right up here to where it says create, and we can click to create an NRT query rule. So uh, just like a, with some of the other rules that we have in um, Azure's or uh, sorry, Microsoft Sentinel, we have to deal with Kusto query language. This, this is going to be another one. In this particular rule, um, the thing to remember about NRT is it's with near real time, is this is not on a schedule. It's not going to check every five minutes. It's not going to check every 10 minutes. It's not going to check every hour. It's, it's checking every single event, okay, that is occurring. And so, um, that's what this is going to do. Ultimately, what I want to do, I'm just going to create a very simple little query using KQL that is going to check for bad sign-in attempts. And whenever somebody puts in a password wrong, um, you know, they attempt to sign in, it we could have it generate an alert if we wanted. Okay, so I'm just going to say bad log on attempt. That's what we're going to call it. We'll just say this is a low severity because it's just checking. You know, when they sign in, you could sign various tactic, tactics, techniques, and procedures, like credential access or something to it if you wanted. Um, but I'm going to click Next, and then here is the query. All right. Again, you don't have to be a KQL expert here. Um, definitely something you can play around with, learn a little bit more about. Uh, you could use ChatGPT to help you write in some more the more advanced stuff. I mean, I have. I, I'll... There's no shame in my game um, as a consultant and all of that. Uh, I, I definitely have no problem looking stuff up if there's something I can't think of. Um, or, heck, use ChatGPT to your advantage if you have access to it. But So this is the table it's going to look at. It's going to look at the sign-in logs with uh, in regards to Azure, uh, where result um, is not equal to. So these are the successful you know, you know, log on attempts, these are just event ID numbers, and then project, and so what it's going to do is it's going to look for these, and then it's also going to project the time generated, the user principal name, location, IP address, result, and result description. So it's just going to give all that information. So then I'll click view the query, and I don't, I probably don't have any bad sign-in attempts, so yeah, so there's that. All right, and uh, so as you can see, um, Query did not throw an error, so we're good there. Okay, so now we uh, we can do the alert mapping. 
custom alerts, add alert mapping if we want, um, custom details to that, alert details. You should be familiar with this already. Okay. Uh, configure how alert rule query results. This is all the same. Same stuff we've seen. Okay. Uh, incident, we've seen all of this. There's nothing different there. Automated response, this is the source stuff. Again, not diving deep into that right now. This is the automated response rules. Um, you know, uh, so you could have an automated response rule if you want. And then review and create and click save. And that's it. We've now created an NRT rule that is now monitoring in real time. Now, one of the things that's kind of neat about Microsoft's Content Hub in regards to Sentinel is that not only do we have data connectors and all that, but we also have uh, all these various analytic rules that can be pulled in from there as well. And I want to show you that now. So here we are on portal.azure.com. If we click the menu button, go to All Services, go to Sentinel. All right, I know you probably get tired of seeing me uh, reopen this up, but a lot of my students who kind of skip around in my courses, they tend to um, forget how to get places. So I, I tend to go over that uh, multiple times. But anyway, here I am in Microsoft Sentinel. If we go here to Content Hub, uh, what we can do is we go here to Content Type and Disable All, and then we're going to say just show me the analytics uh, rule. Rules. So we'll hit apply. So you can see now just the content type that contains uh, analytic rules. Okay. So some of these like Azure Active Directory, Azure Activity, some of these we uh, already got and they that's how we got some of our rules um, that are in our environment already. Okay. But we can take a look at these. We click on these like Cisco Umbrella for example. Click View Details. And they're going to tell you, they're going to give you the information about this, what this is going to link to, uh, the, the media and all that. It's going to actually add some rules regarding Cisco. If we go back over here, we've got, let's scroll down a little bit. Um, here it is. Here's some standalone, just like individual ones. So a client made a web request to request to a potential harmful file. So the thing to understand is you have some of these that are packages, right? Packages that come with multiple rules and their data connectors and all that. And then you have some that are just standalones. So if we click on this one right here, this rule identifies a web request to a URL that holds a file type, including um, PS1, batch, VBS. So we could install that if we want, but you can see there's lots and lots and lots of these that we could, uh, we could pull in here. Okay. So we'll go ahead and click install. We'll go ahead and install this particular rule. And uh, as you can see, it's being installed now. It doesn't usually take very long to get installed. Okay. Um, and then we'll come back over here to under configuration to uh, analytics. All right. And, uh, and now we're on our analytics. After my little refresh there, I'm going to click on rule templates and then I should see it right here. So here is the rule. It's actually a rule template, I should say. So it's not actually an active rule that's been created. It's just a rule template. And from there, we would actually need to create a rule if we wanted to put that in place. We could do that by going here, clicking Create Rule, and then uh, we could follow, go through with the wizard, uh, the actual wizard here. Here's the query, run through all of this. But I'm not going to create a rule at this time on it. I just wanted to kind of show you the uh, the process there. So that's how you can add and configure additional rules utilizing the Content Hub in Microsoft Sentinel. I now want to get into what a uh, watch list are in Microsoft Sentinel. So let's talk about what they are first and then we'll see about uh, creating this. If you do a quick Google or Bing search just on the keywords Microsoft Sentinel watch list, you'll come across this article here, which is what is a watch list. They tell you here that these are going to allow you to correlate data from uh, data sources that you can provide with certain events that are triggered inside of Microsoft Sentinel. Um, some good examples of this would be something like imagine you were trying to monitor some kind of a high value asset or you had certain employees, maybe uh, terminated employees that um, you're keeping an eye on or maybe you're about to terminate some employees or companies about to terminate some employees and they're concerned about what they might do before they get terminated or if they get wind of being terminated. Um, 
you know, things like that. Uh, you could have service accounts that you're monitoring. Uh, watch lists are going to help us pull in specific pieces of information that we want to look at and then uh, you know trigger alerts and go from there if we need if need be so investigate threats so this is when to use it investigate threats respond to incidents quickly rapidly um, based on IP addresses file hashes or other data and this is all going to be related to CSV comma separated values so this gives you a lot of customization you can customize what key uh, keywords and um, all that stuff that you want to be looking for. You could import business data, specific, um, especially if you've got your own custom apps that are generating data related to your business, like in a custom line of business type of scenario. It can be analyzing for certain keywords based on that. Um, reduce alert fatigue. So create a allow list to suppress alert. That's another reason for doing this. So you're not getting so much. Enrich event data. Use watch list to enrich your event data with name value combinations. Um, so you know, it's, it, they're pretty easy to use. They're pretty easy to create. Uh, this is one of those things you can jump in and do relatively quickly. Let's take a look right now. So I'll go right here to portal.azure.com. I'm going to click the menu button, go to all services. Then I'm going to go search and we'll go to we'll search for Sentinel. Search for Microsoft Sentinel, go into the workspace, and then from there we will uh, scroll down towards the bottom under configuration. You'll see watch list. Okay, so first off, I have a, a one that's been already created that was created for me um, by pulling in some of the other um, when I when I set up some of the data connectors and all that. But if I wanted to create one, first thing I could do is I could um, create a very simple CSV file and I've done that right here I've just basically got uh, three little columns here in a CSV file one called server name uh, IP address and country name and maybe we have uh, some some of our tags and things like that on our our machines based on server name IP address and country uh, country name and we want to look based on that so I, I'll uh, save this and then what I can do is click new and uh, I'll give this a name. So I'll call this, I'll just call this server info watch list. And then alias, and that'll be our friendly name. And then alias will just be called server info. We'll click uh, next to go to source. And then from there, uh, we will pull in, I'm going to browse and pull in that file. All right, and then it wants to know the search key. All right. So I could have a specific uh, search key that uh, always pulls this up when I'm trying to uh, find the alert. And I could base that on the server name, IP address, or country name. I'm going to put country name as my search key. And uh, so there you go. We've got our three little fields here. All right. From there, we would click review and create and then click to create. Now, once that's done, if you go back in here to watch list, You'll see your watch list here. Now I don't have any data, so I don't really have anything to show you, but let's look at this one here, which does have some data. If I select this one, go right here and uh, move this arrow over, I can view in logs and it'll actually show me the log data that's uh, found in that watch list. So it's actually doing a, a KQL search and here is all the data that it has discovered. So pretty neat. pulling data from that watch list. Okay, so that is how we can utilize watch list in Microsoft Sentinel. Let's take a look now at threat indicators in Microsoft Sentinel. So here we are on portal.azure.com. If we click the menu button, go to all services, and we'll just search for Sentinel here. We'll click on Sentinel, go into the workspace, and then we're gonna scroll down uh, under where it says threat management, we're going to look for threat intelligence. Now, keep in mind that uh, in our case, we do have to have a, we have to be pulling in from a feed. And uh, in my case, I have already done that. I've done that previously. And I'm pulling in, uh, if I go right here to source, you can see pulse feed. That's where I'm pulling uh, everything in from. You can see the threat intelligence feed that it uh, is pulling all of these, uh, these threat detection patterns in. I can see the uh, date timestamp of those threats that are coming in. I can even see the carrier. You can see this is a uh, continent Asia uh, here. Country is India. Um, 
Got WhatsApp information going on here, pulling in data from that. But uh, this is the idea of these um, threat indicators. It's, it's looking at various patterns from pulse feed. You can see the timestamps and all of that uh, that it's coming in from. The URLs involved, domain names involved, country of origin. All right. And uh, as you can see, this is just the first page. I got 2.3 thousand uh, indicators here. Keep uh, Remember that when you do implement something like pulse feed, it can take a while before this all starts really showing up. So you do need to kind of be patient a little bit on this. Okay. But if you are doing this with me, I do encourage you to explore that a little bit and get a feel for it. It's definitely something to kind of look at. Nothing really here I would stress over. Uh, you can add your own for it to look at. If I go right up here to add new, you, there's different types you can um, you can add there. So you could add a new indicator that you want to look for um, uh, in here if you want. But it's it's looking at the patterns based on the Oasis sticks uh, and all of that that uh, that's that's been created through Pulse Feed. All right. So very cool, definitely something to check out. Nothing really here to stress over, nothing to memorize, but definitely something to, worth uh, taking a look at. Hey, this is John Christopher. I hope you enjoyed getting to experience a little bit of this course, and I hope you'll join me on the full adventure. If you'll check the description of this video, you'll see a link that'll show you how you can get access to the full course. Now, in the full course, you're gonna learn how to set up a practice environment where you can practice hands-on and I'm going to provide you with lots of virtual simulations that you can do 24-7. All you need is a web browser. So I hope you'll join me, and uh, I hope you'll also give me a like and subscribe. I'm trying very, very hard to get the this channel to build and grow, and uh, so I hope you'll take the time to do that.